Guys, I'm so excited for this episode. My guest today is an entrepreneur, author, speaker, and coach. He's spent over 30 years on the front lines of entrepreneurship and business. He's helped tens of thousands of entrepreneurs with six, seven, and eight-figure businesses to grow and scale. He's the founder of a company that helps entrepreneurs run their business from the passenger seat. Mm. This company, Simple Operations, gives entrepreneurs the systems and the processes they need to calm the chaos, execute predictably, and achieve success. So by helping them simplify their business operations, something that most people find quite a bit of a clusterfuck, they help their clients make a massive impact in the world without having to do it all themselves, which I'm a huge proponent of. But his story isn't all sunshine and rainbows. There's quite a few twists and turns. In his 20s, as a Fortune 500 consultant, he found himself working with some of the most successful people in the world. And that's when he met his wife, Katie, and he ended up selling his consulting business. And together, they invested heavily in the Florida real estate market, and they did well. They built actually three multi-million dollar real estate companies and were making well over six figures a month. They were super prosperous, but highly leveraged. And if you're a normal human being who hasn't lived under a rock for the past 20 years, you know that in 2007, the U.S. experienced a massive foreclosure crisis that shut down real estate sales in Florida and by 2008 had shut down sales across the country and they lost everything. And they lost everything to the point that they were forced to declare bankruptcy. He says that it was his darkest hour. Rising from the ashes, though, they built a company where they worked with the major lenders and real estate brokers all over the country, and they taught other realtors what they'd learned. And within a year of bankruptcy, they had built back to liquid millionaire status. By 2011, get this, they were number 21 on the Inc. 500 list of the world's fastest growing companies. And in 2012 and 2013, they were featured again on the list affirming an absolutely remarkable turnaround. He is the creator of the Billionaire Code, a roadmap for entrepreneurs that it was blatantly copied by some other internet marketers who shall not be named. He's been featured in Success, Entrepreneur, and Inc. magazines. He's been interviewed on MSNBC, CNBC, Fox News, though that might not be such a thing statement anymore, <laughs> and Wall Street Journal. He is known for his incredible vulnerability, integrity, and generosity. He and his Katie have built not just a successful business, but simultaneously an incredible marriage and brilliantly parented two wonderful kids. He, this is truly the definition of having built it all. He is the embodiment of what's possible when an entrepreneur takes true personal responsibility and ownership of their own personal growth and development. I'm proud, so fucking proud to introduce you to my friend, the incredible Alex Sharfin. Welcome to the show, brother. Thank you, Ani. That was one heck of an intro, man. I appreciate it. Oh, man. I've wanted to have this conversation for you, with you for so long. I feel like this time that we happen to be speaking is so interesting, just with all the stuff that's going on. And we've had such amazing conversations on our hikes, entrepreneurship, leadership, all the shit that comes up in the process. I want to kick off with a little anecdote. Fresh. This is fresh. So fresh. As we're recording, the, we've just seen Russia invade Ukraine. And Ukraine's basically under attack. The Russian fighter jets and bombers have been just destroying them. And uh, the troops have, the Russian troops are basically advancing on Kiev. So the United States offered to evacuate the Ukrainian president Zelensky from Kiev. And so when the U.S. offered him an airlift from the country, he said he needed ammunition, not a ride. And he's right now running at like a 91% approval rating in Ukraine. And as this quote started to circulate, people started to idealize him more, right? And... This guy is such a poster child for leadership. So he's the president now, but in 2006, he won the, the Ukrainian version of Dancing Like the Stars with his <laughs> now wife. And 
So the U.S. says, hey, we can give you a ride out of the country. No, give me some ammo, not a ride. And when he got elected in 2019, he told lawmakers, bureaucrats across Ukraine that I don't want my picture in your offices. The president is not an icon, an idol or a portrait. Hang your kids photos instead and look at them each time you're making a decision. And what, and this is communist former Soviet Union where the president or the head of state's picture is just plastered all over in every government official's office. And so for him to say this, for him to even embody this right now, and this picture is all over of him in camo, having, uh, having a meal with, with soldiers. This guy is like really embodying leadership. And it's such a great example for some of the things that we've talked about. Let me ask you this, how, what is your definition? What is your brand of leadership? Because I think that's something that you do exceptionally well. And a lot of people would benefit from, you've clearly gotten yourself into crisis and navigated yourself out of crisis. You've built so many different companies. Your churn rate is for employees in terms of retention is so low that I think that's a really extraordinary statistic. So tell us about how you see leadership. So we were advisors to the FHFA and the US Treasury, which both advised the White House. And in 2009, we wrote a series of white papers that were actually literally copied and pasted into one of Obama's press releases and then one of their policy documents. And we know because we made a mistake in one of them and they carried the mistake over. I was an official advisor to the FHFA and to Director Lockhart, who ran the Treasury at the time. And not only was I an, an advisor, but I was in the room in a lot of the big meetings back then. So when you ask, what is my brand of leadership or how do I look at leadership? I think... If we look at it in an entrepreneurial sense, I think the issue that the majority of entrepreneurs have is they're stuck in what we call transactional management. And there's transactional management that can move to transformational leadership. But let me explain transactional management first. And what's interesting, I don't think that it's just transactional management of team members. I think we transactionally manage our kids. In a lot of ways, we transactionally manage ourselves. We transactionally manage marriages. And here's what I mean by transactional management. It's tell people what to do, check that it got done. Tell them what to do again, check that it got done, tell them what to do again. And any entrepreneur who's ever gone through the process of starting to hire team members knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's exhausting. It's, it's that, that almost micromanagement of task by task basis. And what we teach as far as leadership is that leadership is a contact sport, but if you're telling somebody what they need to do step by step, you're going to have a lot of challenges. Proximity to people is crucially important, but so is the right process. And so what we teach is what we call transformational leadership. A lot of entrepreneurs say, oh, I tried to hire somebody, but I'm a terrible manager. Yeah, we all are. Don't manage, lead. And when, you, when I look at entrepreneurs, I've never met an entrepreneur that says I'm a terrible leader. The, the very fact that you started a business, the very fact that you're doing something outside of the norm, the very fact that you're trying to change the status quo in some way with your business Im implies and both proves that you are a leader. And so transformational leadership is where you give clear outcomes. This is where I want us to go. And you coach success along the way. So you make it very clear where we're going. And then you make sure that people don't fail by coaching their success. And then you get leveraged results and you give them the outcome you want rather than the step to take. And it's very much, I think a lot of people, People end up managing their kids transactionally. It's like, hey, you need to do the dishwasher. Hey, you need to get your room clean. Hey, you need to do this. Hey, you know, you need to get up. And now, and man, you know, we've fallen into the trap of becoming our children's morning routines where they get up in the morning. We're telling them everything they need to do, follow them around the house. And we recently switched and said, hang on, you know, now we're transactionally managing our whole life here outside of work. And so now the kids have a clear outcome. Like they know when they need to be ready. They know what needs to happen before they're ready to leave the house. And in such a short period of time of us stepping out of transactional management, giving them clear outcomes, coaching them along the way, making sure they have the resources they need. They're now like autonomous and responsible for themselves in the morning. And I use that as a comparison to running a business. When you are telling people what to do and checking what they got, they got done and telling them what to do again, you don't develop people. In fact, you like you anti-develop people. They actually become dumber than they are when you hire them. They become slower than they are when you hire them. And it's not because they're actually dumb or slow. It's because they're waiting for you to give them the next step. And when you empower people to chase an outcome, whether that's a process you've delegated to them or some big change in the company that needs to happen, depending on the level of that team member, you actually empower them to step into who they are and 
move things forward. And when human beings have clear outcomes and they're coached along the way, that's one of the big elements of getting people into what I call momentum. Some people call it flow state. Some people call it in the zone. I call it in momentum. When you think about us as entrepreneurs, that word momentum, we don't just hear that word. We feel that word. And you yeah, look back yeah. through your life and you think of any period of momentum you've been in, I guarantee you, you had a clear outcome as to where you were going or what you wanted to achieve or what you wanted to get out of. Like when we were bankrupt, that's one of the periods of highest momentum I can remember. And we just, we wanted to pay our bills. We had a crisis. But when I look back at that time, we were in such crazy momentum. It was, like I said, one of the highest periods of moment, momentum we were ever in. And we had a clear outcome. Let's get out of this. That's such a great illustration of the right way to do things and the wrong way. And it's hard to be so black and white sometimes, but when it comes to when it comes to entrepreneurial leadership and also kids, right? What I so we happen to do the same, we help entrepreneurs achieve the same outcomes through completely different but very complementary vehicles. So your focus is all around systems and processes, and my focus is all around the internal development that an entrepreneur needs to go through to be able to operate at that level, execute those systems and processes. So something that I find, there's actually two things that keeps entrepreneurs from managing in a transformational way. One is their ego is inextricably linked to every single thing, whether it's being the one in charge with the kids to turning their employees into kids and they have a need to be needed and they have a need to be the one in charge. They have, the, they have a need to be involved in every single thing. And it's this deep seated scarcity that keeps them coming back every single time, micromanaging. It keeps them from empowering the team. It keeps them starting fires that they then have to put out. And it just creates such a swirl that they then use those circumstances as an excuse as to why they can't step back, why they can't trust their team. And so they're essentially creating this bind for themselves that they use as a rationalization or justification. And same with the kids. So many people, they use their kids as a way to feel important, a way to feel in charge, in, in power. And so many parents, they take out all that frustration, all that rage on their kids by trying to control their kids. And what I love most about, you've been such an example for me, right? When I saw you at Dillard's place, when you were holding that baby and it was just such a cool experience because little known fact about Alex, Alex is a baby whisperer. And can, just the way you relate to babies and kids and what you shared in terms of helping them really lead themselves. Can you think of, I can't think of a better gift to give your children, your kids, than to teach them how to take ownership over the outcomes, how to take ownership over their needs, how to really be responsible for themselves and be self-managed. Because the, one of the biggest points of failure that I see for entrepreneurs that keeps them stuck is that they never learn to manage themselves. They never learn to lead themselves. And now they're in a place where they have to lead employees, they have to lead their team. And they're talking to their team as kids yeah, rather than adults. And therefore, they're always stuck in this transactional place. Yeah. Yeah, Ani, it's interesting that you said need to be needed. So, you know, what we help entrepreneurs do, and like you said, it's very similar. So people have probably heard this from you, but what we show entrepreneurs, the process, the structure and routine so they can lead from a passenger seat. Let me define that because you did it in the intro. You mentioned yeah, it in the intro. For us, what, it mean, what a passenger seat means is that the entrepreneur is no longer functioning Tactically. Driving is a tactic. It's something you can hire somebody to do. In fact, a lot of my friends have drivers. My closest friend since college yeah. in South Florida is in between cars right now. He like first world problems. He sold this Ferrari and he's waiting for his Tesla Plaid to show up. And uh, that's but, really hard. Just, yeah, <laughs> my heart really goes out to him. Bad for him. So now he has a driver on call. And so he's actually given up the tactic of driving. I use that as a metaphor for a business. I think what happens to a yeah. lot of entrepreneurs and businesses is because they never did have that empowerment when they were younger. They want to be involved in everything and they feel like they have to touch and see and drive everything. And in fact, here's what's interesting. One of the conversations we have most often with our high level members, we have a group of members that have their businesses over 3 million, but many are in the tens of millions. 
And one of the conversations that recurs over and over again is my team doesn't need me anymore and I'm feeling vacant and hollow and frustrated and irritated. And there's all types of different languages that people use. In fact, to, we do a quarterly summit with our members where they come into Austin for three days and we get them prepared for the next quarter. And we had this panel one, at one of the summits where it was our most successful members. It was the people who had gone from seven to eight figures. That's what we promised. We wanted to show people they could really do it. And one of the people on the panel who's given me permission to share this, his name's Daniel Rosen, who runs a company called Software Repair Cloud, which is really an education company and a software company and a coaching company kind of wrapped into one. And Daniel's company had gone from about 2 million when he started with us to the time he was on the panel, I think it was about 18. I think he's at 30 now. And I said, Daniel, why don't you tell us how everything's going? And he like dropped the numbers of how his business had grown and how many people he'd added. And then he goes, but for me personally, I'm having a really hard time. And this was on a panel where it's supposed to be sharing success. And he's, I don't feel like my team needs me anymore. Nobody's calling me anymore. Installed the cadence. We, at the time we called it the cadence. Now we call it the simple operation system. So it's this system that allows an entrepreneur to step out of the business and really lead from a strategic place. And he's, we installed the operation system. And now my team doesn't need me anymore. And I'm feeling really like depressed and frustrated. And so here we are in the middle of this panel where we're supposed to be sharing success. And it turned into an intervention. Wow. And what we had to talk to him about was, Daniel, what do you want to do? What's the exciting part for you? When you first start delegating, you need to delegate what you're best at. Right, now that right. you've gotten to the point where you've delegated, now you need to say, what do you really want to do? And discuss that with your team and have them tell you. But we have entrepreneurs routinely go through this crisis of confidence because they're not vitally needed because they work themselves out of the position that they're in. And for anyone who's going through that right now, one of the things that I always share with our members is... You need to make space for what is coming next. And as entrepreneurs, if we don't have a full calendar, if we're not like barely treading water, we feel like we're not important. But the reality of running a business is if you're barely treading water, you are in trouble. You just don't know it yet. Because whatever comes next is going to put you underwater and then everything starts to, to cave in. And I always share with entrepreneurs, if you're built, if you are, if your days are getting tactically harder rather than tactically easier, you're building a house of cards. That's because the more tactics you're responsible for, the more your team is not responsible for them. And if you get pulled out of it, that house of cards is going to come tumbling down. And it's, a, it's one of those things that as an entrepreneur, we need to be thinking that we don't want to be needed, that we need to get in that place where it isn't dire necessity that we're there every day, because that means we've actually built an organization that's capable of succeeding without us. And if we don't do that, we will always be in some way tethered to the business in a tactical right. And so many entrepreneurs, they start their business originally unconsciously out of this desire to be needed because as kids, they never felt needed, wanted, worthy. And the initiation into entrepreneurship is from that place of deficit. And so yeah. the entire business, I find this with so many clients, is built to basically cover up all that deficit. It's this need for approval. It's this need for belonging. It's this need for control. And all of this stuff gets, yeah, attention. All of this gets projected on the business. It gets projected on the team. It gets projected on the clients. And it's impossible to extricate oneself from that because they aren't aware of what they're doing. And the entire structure, literally the org chart is built around their unconscious patterning. And the other thing that I see often, which I don't know if you're seeing this, but so many of my clients are having challenges with hiring. And I feel like when, or, when entrepreneurs build a company around themselves and they're in the middle of it and they're really needed for every single aspect of it, they're really in control, then it's really their company. It's less of a movement. It's less of a vision that, you know, other people can share in, they can feel ownership in. And most of these people have trouble attracting talent and really high quality talent because the highest caliber talent doesn't want to basically be part of someone's dream. They want to share in that dream. And if you look at Elon Musk and you look at the even Branson, people are attracted to those companies. There's a waiting list of people who are just dying to work for them, even though we hear all these reports of how intense those environments are. Amazon as well. It's because people feel some sense of ownership over that. And so that's, there's a couple of roles that, that I see entrepreneurs needing to play to grow the business and 
One is that strategic visionary role. It's really painting that vision. I know you talk about this a lot. And then there's that coach role for the team to help really develop them. But unless they know themselves and unless they develop themselves, it's really hard to do this on the outside. And this is something that you've really exemplified in such a vulnerable way because one of the things I appreciate most about you is because a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs who are building brands they really like manicuring their lawn. They want to show the best aspects of themselves and they want to hide all the challenging parts. So let me ask you this. What are some of the things that you've had to reconcile within yourself to make, you know, the level of progress and growth that you've been able to make externally? What are some of the shifts you've had to make internally to make that possible? Wow. Ronnie, I'm 49 years old and I started my first company when I was 17. I exit or 16. I exited that company and then started another one when I was 19 with the person I was just talking about who's being driven around South Florida and exited that a couple of years later, selling it out to him. And so my entrepreneurial history is not short. It's I've been doing this for over 30 years. And so when I, when you ask the question, what have you had to reconcile so much? But I think if we look at some of the main, if I was to look at what are the main things or what are the major things that I've had to shift or change is that I think one of the biggest issues for us as entrepreneurs, I call it the entrepreneur's dilemma, is that we need more help than the average person to get to where we really want to go. It's just because we're trying to do more. We're not trying to get a job. There's a certain amount of help you need to get a job. There's a heck of a lot, exponentially more help you need to actually run on a business. And But any request for help makes us feel vulnerable and exposed. And when I was a kid, I didn't get a lot of help. I was in a school situation that wasn't super supportive, like a lot of entrepreneurs. I had a couple of years where things were okay, but for the most part, it was very challenging. Socially, I didn't get along with a lot of other people. I didn't, I wasn't able to hack that social code until I was much older and understand how to relate to other people. And so I had a hard time when I was younger. First, it was very difficult for me to to get help and then to ask for help. And second, it was just as hard for me to delegate responsibility to people. So in my 20s, I ran a huge multi-million dollar consultancy. We had about 50 people, 14 offices in the US and Latin America, remote locations. I was, there was a ton going on, but I built my team basically as like a team of assistants mm-hmm. for what I was doing. And so I was in the middle of the business. I did not transfer responsibility. I was afraid to. I was afraid to ask for help. I was afraid to be vulnerable. I was afraid to tell my team what was really going on. I have a slight level of dyslexia. And I didn't start sharing that with any team I ran until I was in my 30s. So I used to fake like I was reading sometimes, like when somebody would hand me handwriting and I couldn't read it, I would like make an excuse and hand it to someone else and go, hey, I need to go look at something. Can you read this to everyone? I'd like stand outside the door and listen and because I was so afraid to be vulnerable. I was so afraid to be exposed. And I think if I look at probably the biggest shift that I've made in my entrepreneurial career is re- recognizing and realizing that vulnerability and sharing with the people around you what's really going on is the gateway to get the help you actually need. And I was in an industry, international consulting and being a manufacturer's rep and doing a whole bunch of consulting just outside of, of sales and marketing where things like never let them see you sweat and fake it until you make it and all those, those, well, those weren't just suggestions. That's how everybody ran their lives back then. And you didn't show vulnerability. You did anything you could to cover up vulnerability to make sure that nobody ever figured it out. And it was such a challenging environment to be in, but it was such a good lesson to learn that in reality, the less vulnerable you are, the less help you're ever going to get. The less you show people what really matters to you, the less people are going to believe in what you're doing. There's this interview with Elon Musk, which I think is, he has so many amazing interviews. And one of them is when he was told that, I think it was Buzz Aldrin, one of his heroes, had said that his pursuit of going to Mars was like folly and it was a joke and he really didn't need to do it. And I'm paraphrasing. And Musk immediately started crying. And rather than saying, let's stop the interview, he just, he talks through it in a way where his voice was breaking and he was upset and he was clearly frustrated by it, but he let the entire world see that this is like the most important thing to him. And that's why he's pursuing this. And that level of vulnerability, I guarantee you there were engineers in college that day watching that interview saying, okay, that's where I'm going to work. Yeah. No matter what it takes, I'm going to get a job there. And When you go back and look at some of the interviews with Steve Jobs, same thing. Like he just opened up about what was really going on for him and what was frustrating him. And sometimes in a way that people got really uncomfortable with, but there was a level of of reality there. There was a level of, there is no veneer. This is just what's going on. And so for me, 
learning that and being real with the people around me and being real with the people I have friendships with and with my team has made it so that I don't have to hide. And I've completely shaken off things like fake it until you make it and don't ever let them see you sweat. I think actually fake it until you make it may be one of the most damaging phrases in the history of entrepreneurship right above don't ever let them see you sweat. And it's just, it creates this environment of lack of vulnerability, lack of trust. You're pretending like you're somebody, you're pretending like you, you have things figured out, which keeps you patently stuck and really painted into the corner of where you are. Yeah, this is reminiscent of the messaging that most people receive as kids. There's a performance oh, yeah. expectation. And unless you're operating at that threshold, you know, you're not good enough. You're criticized, you're shamed, you're guilted, you're punished. And really your entire sense of self is being called into question. And so kids adapt by having this exterior, this invulnerable exterior, and then inside it's a completely different story. And then the business becomes part of this exterior and it's insufferable because for most entrepreneurs, their business is a big part of their life. And if you can't really be yourself in business, you have to be someone else. And that's the whole internet marketing, the whole startup culture, all of these movements right now, the way they're being led is that here's the formula for success. Go do step one, step two, step three, as someone else laid out based on their success and fit inside this box. And if you do that, then you're guaranteed to succeed. And so we have, or the Gary V style where people are projecting their values and their beliefs and their, the hustle might work for him. He probably enjoys it. But there's a ton of people who watch that and then they compare themselves to those standards and they use that to beat themselves up. And then they show up in their business with this almost double life. And people can even unconsciously just feel that. The employees can feel that, hey, this is something, I don't know what it is, but something feels off. This person seems too perfect, too invulnerable, too above it all. And it's hard to relate to someone. You can be afraid of them, but it's hard to genuinely love and respect and admire and be inspired by someone when there is no crack. Yeah. It just seems so perfect. Yeah. And there's no question. It's funny that you bring up Gary Vee. He is, he's such an incredible entrepreneur in so many different ways. Yeah. And has really taken advantage of new communication channels and new media channels in a way that I don't think really any other individual has, maybe other than Cardone, which is a whole nother bag of worms that we probably shouldn't, yeah. or can of worms, sorry. English is my second language. So when it comes to using those types of phrases, I usually use them wrong. Bag of worms. go anywhere here. <laughs> With, it's interesting you bring up Gary Vee because I think he's a hero to so many people. Rightfully, he's self-made. He's created this massive organization really out of nothing. He's got best-selling books. He now, when it comes to Web 3.0, he's almost become like the unofficial spokesperson for where the internet is going. And you listen to him and he has this, this very clear sense of direction and what's happening. And he's very good at defending the future of Web 3.0, explaining it. So in so many ways, he's just an extraordinary entrepreneur. But I saw him at, I've seen him actually at, at a few events and I met him a couple of times and yeah. I've seen a few times. And he spoke one time for my friend, Russell Brunson, who runs Click Funnels. And Russell had invited me to this exclusive event. He's going to probably hate hearing this podcast because I can't remember what the event was for, but it was for some launch or something. And we all flew up to Boise and we went to the stadium of whatever the team is in Boise. I'm not big on sports, but it had a red or blue field, I think. And Gary Vee was one of the speakers and somebody from the audience asked him, how I've got a family. How do I balance having a family and being an entrepreneur? And he said, here's what you need to do. You talk to your partner. In this case, for me, it's my wife. And you let them know that during the week, you're an entrepreneur. And on the weekends, you'll come home and you might be there to be a father and a, and a, a parent and be, to be in the family. And that's how I run mine. And some weekends, I'm not there. And there's a lot of times where I'm, I don't need to be there or not that I don't need to be there, but I can't be there because I've got something scheduled. I've got something where I need to go. But once a quarter, I go all in on a full week vacation with my family. He might've said a week, he might've said two weeks. I don't, can't remember. Yeah. And I remember sitting there thinking, this is the problem with entrepreneurship. We get into entrepreneurship in some way because we're pursuing freedom. And then we create this incarceration of mm -hmm. running a company in a way where we really can't make the decisions we want to. Now, I'll take it one step further. I would say that in Gary Vee's case, having a $100 million company, having the profitability that he talks about, having the wealth that he's created through things that have happened recently, 
he has the ability to be there if he wants to, but he's not. And so what is the reason that he is still in that place where he doesn't show up for his family and he does, he's not there hardly ever, according to what he says himself. And I think it's because so many entrepreneurs have bought into this myth that if you work seven, eight, entrepreneurs get, go from having a nine to five to being an entrepreneur for freedom and they work a nine to nine. They're yeah, lucky. Yeah. A lot of them are working a nine to three in the morning and or three to th three to 4.30. It's excruciating what some people do to themselves. And I think we need to take a step back and ask the question, why? And I think part of the discussion that we're having today really has to involve that most entrepreneurs, we brought it up, most entrepreneurs in some way have massive trauma. They have either trauma from their family of origin, trauma from things that have happened to them in school. There's trauma somewhere. There's been judgment somewhere. There's been an overbearing or absentee parent somewhere. Yeah. And when I hear something like that, I'm like, that's somebody who's uncomfortable being in a family unit because of what happened to them when they were a child. And, and, and uncomfortable being still or slowing down. Man, I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs come to me and they're like, okay, I, I've heard your stuff. I want to I wanna 10X in the next few years. I really want to scale this thing. But right now I'm overcommitted. I'm working 70, 80 hour weeks. There's so much going on. So I'm not really sure how to do that. So let's figure this out. And when we dive in, to why they're so busy. It's because being, not being busy and having space is their worst nightmare. Yeah, it creates the space to hear your own thoughts. Yeah, because, you know, I mandate with their consent, obviously with their participation, that they start putting blocks in their schedule where there's just, they're doing nothing. And they, they find a way to fill that up with something or the other. And there's just this profound inability to be still because that's when all the stuff comes up and the trauma, the unprocessed stuff. And I, it just seems like most entrepreneurs are running away from themselves and they've created this entire life, this entire business, this entire existence where there's a little bit of self-righteousness because, hey, I'm important. I have this interview. I have this to do. I have that to do. I can't be with my family because they still see it as an obligation. It's not something that's intrinsically fulfilling. It's not, their orientation is not, hey, I, this is part of what brings me joy. And so you are one of those people who actually have struck this balance. So for everyone listening, Alex and Katie are both involved in the business. So you guys have been running businesses together for a while. You're one of the few couples, and there's honestly very few that I can name, who I actually respect, not just from a business perspective, but also from a relational perspective, because a lot of my work spans the relational side as well. And it's really hard to see entrepreneurs, they sacrifice one for the other, because on some level it, it's an either or, but you've actually managed to have such a well-rounded, well-developed ecosystem where your relationship is thriving. You guys love each other, You've been married for a while. You have two kids together. You deeply care about each other. I've seen the way you guys treat each other. And there's such, the word I love is devotion. There's such a devotion in your relationship to each other. And I think that's really exquisite. Will you talk a little bit about how, how that has manifested in your life? What are the shifts? What are the changes? What are the perspectives that you've had to incorporate and really implement for both of you to have not just a thriving business, but also a thriving relationship. You know, Ani, I think that if you're a successful entrepreneur, then you should create a level of freedom for yourself. And if you haven't created a level of freedom for yourself and you're still making decisions based around what the business needs and what you need to do, then you've really, again, you've created this level of almost incarceration. Like, why is it like that? And so for me, I grew up in a household with a father who was pretty absentee, traveled all the time. When Gary Vee says that, it reminds me of my childhood. And, it meant, and I remember how uncomfortable it was when my dad would come home. Not when he left. It was actually quiet when he left. But wow. he would come home and upset the family unit because he was gone so often. Yeah. And I resolved that when, I, when we had kids, I didn't want to do that. And I wasn't going to allow that to happen. I wanted to be able to actually have a relationship with my kids. I wanted to be able to understand my kids, be able to support them, be able to end up as adults where I had a, a friendship and an advisory relationship with my kids instead of when I was the, 
within weeks of turning 18, I moved out as fast as I could because I wanted to get away from the situation while I was in because it felt unstable and it felt like there wasn't a lot of consistency and it felt like there wasn't a lot of support there. And so when you talk about what are those shifts, I think one of the things that we need to admit to ourselves as entrepreneurs is that we actually create our reality. And if your reality sucks, then you have to examine why are you making it suck? And I always tell entrepreneurs, if you don't have the business you want, you haven't become the person who can run it yet. So what are those issues that are causing you to be in a business where you have to work 70 hours a week? What are the things that you're dealing with where you feel like you have to get up and instead of taking care of yourself, you have to go straight to a computer and start working and start the day with adrenaline, start the day putting your cortisol through the roof. And so many entrepreneurs today in their 20s and 30s have been trained that this is what success looks like. And the reality that I see all the time is that when we get entrepreneurs to start taking care of themselves, so for me, a big shift was self-care. In my 20s, self-care meant that I took seven or to 10 hours a week off. I read an article once that said, Bill Gates worked every day in his 20s. So I was like, oh, that's how you do it. I'll work every day in my 20s. And I did. And I would work and work and work. And then I would hit like a two day period where I just sleep for two days and feel sick. And then I would get back up and do the same thing. And for me, one of the big shifts was like, okay, when I was 30, I had a doctor tell me I was his most likely candidate for a heart attack. And he, and I was in South Florida and he said, I have an aging population and you're number one. And I remember that that was a wake up call for me. I'm like, oh crap. Like having all the success in the world, I was very wealthy for my age at 30. I was a multimillionaire, had a huge company. I was dealing with large organizations. I was respected in my industry and it was like a punch in the face. Like, oh my God, I could die. And I started shifting and learned that self-care is actually a gateway drug to even higher levels of success. And what's funny is when you look at billionaires, regardless of who they are and what the public impression is, they're taking care of themselves and they have advisors that they talk to and there's people that they offload with and there's things that they do to remain calm, remain collected. I remember one time um, being up at Remax and I was meeting with Dave Leninger, the founder of Remax, multi-billionaire with the largest house in Colorado, second largest house in Arizona. He recently built onto us and now he's got the largest house in both states. And no joke, like that was a, a goal he had when he retired. And yeah, Dave pulled up in his Porsche in front of Remax. And I was waiting for him outside because I was walking around outside. I like to move when I'm not, when I'm waiting for something. And Dave opened the door and the, there was an audio of Acres and Diamonds playing. It's an old Earl Nightingale audio. Yeah. So here's a guy who's done it. Here's a guy who's won. And his way of taking care of himself was like listening to the same audios, listening to the same sentiments, re re reinforcing this, this audio tape that he'd listened to for literally 40 or 50 years. And so when I look at one of the major shifts, what is, is to take care of myself. And then I think probably the biggest shift for what you asked is that as an entrepreneur, if you want to be successful, put your marriage first and create absolute transparency in your marriage. And here's what I mean by that. That doesn't mean you're putting more hours into your marriage than you are into your business. That's unrealistic. And I think you'd annoy each other. But what it does mean is that you're not making decisions in the business without considering the marriage. And for Katie and I, if for both of us, it's not a hell yes, then we just don't do it. And we align on a daily basis. We sit down every morning and we go through what are one of our frameworks, the Momentum Planner, this tool that we use, our team uses, a lot of our friends use, this planner where we sit down and we align. And so we know that there's a connection made every day. And on a quarterly basis, we set up our quarterly goals. On a monthly basis, we create a strategic plan for our relationship. This is what we're going to do. This is what we're doing with the house, with the properties we own, with the ranch that we just bought, the issues with the kids, what, what are we doing for vacations? And so there's this high level of commitment to resolving the number one issue in marriages, which is communication. And yeah. you solve the number one issue of communication, and then you chase a net worth goal together. You solve the number two issue of money issues. And so we make sure that we knock those two out of the way through process. And then we're radically candid and authentic and real with each other. And so that was a major shift for me prior to being with Katie. Anyone who I was in a relationship with had to understand that I was an entrepreneur first. And when I got together with Katie, it shifted to, I was going to treat the relationship first and then be an entrepreneur. and the highest levels of success that I ever had came after that decision was made, not before. What sort of internal, emotional, or mindset shifts did you find yourself making to be able to actually make the processes stick? I think being radically transparent with somebody is incredibly difficult. In fact, living a transparent life is incredible, incredibly difficult. When, when I go on a podcast or I'm on stage being interviewed or somebody asks me a question from the audience, 
I'm not passing, I no longer pass it through the filter of what's going to make me look good. And in a marriage, I think, especially at the beginning of any relationship, we pass almost everything we do through a filter of what's going to make me look good yeah. and what's yeah. going to, what is going to give my spouse the right impression or what is going to make them like love me even more. And instead of just saying, like, here's what's really going on. And I think for me, being with Katie from almost the very beginning, I didn't want to have a relationship like I had prior to her where it really was like, uh, there's a tremendous amount of pressure in the relationship because I was always acting like the person I thought I needed to be. And so I think the main shift was deciding that this was a place where I was going to be completely transparent and authentic and real, and then trusting that would work out. And we've now been together for 20 years, married for 18 in, in December and, or sorry, in January. And so when I think about, oh no, it's not January it's, or December, it's October 1st. I'm terrible with dates. Like even my anniversary, even though it's happened 20 or 18 times. But when I, when we first started dating and living together, prior to being married, I told Katie things that I'd never told anybody. Mm -hmm. And now at 49 years old and she's 44, there's nothing from my past that she doesn't know. And that's a hard place to be. It's always, sorry, it's not a hard place to be. It's an incredible place to be. It's a hard place to achieve and to get to. Because yeah, okay. when you talk to people in relationships, they say things like, oh, we don't talk about past relationships. We don't talk about if we had sex with other people. We don't talk about the issues that we had when we were children. And I'm like, okay, so what you're doing is you're choosing to leave this energetic and psychic space between you. And I think for the relationship, that's been the biggest thing is that deciding that being 100% transparency, transparent had to be okay. And, you know, Katie and I got together when I was 30 and she was 24. And so there was a lot of life there. It's taken a lot of years to communicate everything. And sometimes, so, hey, I don't think I've ever told you about this, but there's this weird thing that happened when I was younger. But when things come up, we communicate them and we're transparent. And it makes all the difference in the world because energetically, there's no barriers between us. That's beautiful. I think uh, the ability to be transparent with partner really begins with our ability to be transparent with ourselves. Yeah. And there's a lot of people who I've been there when I was younger, living in a low level or high level of self-deception. Yeah. Where we tell a story to ourselves. We sell ourselves on this Kool-Aid, but there's actually, we're not being fully transparent and honest with ourselves. And if we can't acknowledge ourselves, that gets projected on other people, including partner, team, employees, clients. And we fear that same lack of acknowledgement and that makes us withhold even more. And that creates this internal pressure and this wall and it becomes a barrier to intimacy. And then most people in relationships, they assume that the barrier is fixed and they build an entire life around it and eventually Something happens that keeps making that wall stronger and people grow apart. Let me ask you this. So you've obviously had a very prolific relational career. And that's, you've been through so much ups, downs, good times, really tough times. You raised two incredible kids. You built an incredible life together. What are a couple of things on the relational front that you see ahead of you that you would love to create or instantiate in your life. Katie and I talk about this all the time. We're at a point where now we built, I don't know exactly how many, but a bunch of multi-million dollar companies together. And we've made hundreds of millions of dollars in gross revenue, gross revenue for ourselves and tens of millions in profitability and, and like exponentially more for our clients. And when you say what is on the horizon relationally, is that Katie and I are now at the point where our vision for our future is not just running the company that we have and running and having it run by a team so we can work strategically, but also partnering with entrepreneurs around the world to help them grow their businesses. And we have the first few deals that we've been outlining to be able to do that. And it's something that I always wanted to do my whole career, Ani, but I feel like there's this thing that Katie always talks about, divine timing and divine order. When something doesn't happen the speed you want it to, you have to trust in divine timing and divine order that the universe is unfolding as it should. And I feel like, and I'd done this earlier, I don't think I would have been in a stable enough place for myself to be able to partner and lead from a place of neutrality, from a place of advisorship, not getting too far involved, from a place of 
being able to truly see what the issues are and not just trying to diagnose it from afar without understanding the right things to look at. And so for us, we're at this place now where we don't just feel confident in doing this. We're really excited about it. And I envision us having this business where we help people grow. And eventually there's definitely a, a path of growth for the business. But just as importantly, having these partnerships around the world where we're helping other entrepreneurs change the world and avoid some of the shortfalls and some of the pitfalls that we went through. And that is a 100% relationship play. And I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs who become partners in businesses without understanding that it is a relationship play. And so for us, the, I think the ability that we've created in creating the marriage that we have makes us both not just capable advisors, but um, incredibly effective advisors to other people because we've created a foundation for relationship in the most important relationship in our lives. In fact, what a lot of people would say, including one of my coaches, Kylie Ryan, that your nervous system is regulated by the relationship you have with your significant other. If they're dysregulated, so are you. And we've created a level of trust and security in our relationship where we are regulated to the point where I know we can be of value to others. So that's what's on the horizon and what we're really excited about. That's beautiful. What about for you on a personal level? Are there things or areas that looking at in terms of your own growth? Yeah, for sure. My entire life, I've approached the world through a very strong warrior energy. I used to even use the language of a warrior in business. When we were, when I was a consultant, I used to tell people my team was like a team of assassins mm -hmm. and we will go out and kill for you. And we won't just hurt the competition. We will eliminate them and make sure they don't eat. And in the relation, in the industry I was in, people ate that stuff up. They loved it. Like we, we got contracts because I said that. And I would have wow. people come to me and say, we want to hire the team of assassins. And warrior energy is exhausting. It is draining. It is hard to keep up. And so for me, now that I'm crossing from 49 to 50 this year in November, what I'm looking at is how do I lead from a place of more energetics? And how do I lead from a place of delegating success, not just delegating the tasks? And how do I step out of this warrior energy and more into the archetype of being the king, the lover, the magician? There's this book, King, Warrior, Lover, Magician, I think. Yeah. King, Magician, Warrior, Lover. I can always get the order wrong. But when you look at those archetypes, in order to be a fully developed male and fully be able to step into the masculine, you have to develop all those archetypes. And so for me, there's a high level of focus on understanding those mm -hmm. and understanding where they play out in my personality and letting go more and more of navigating the world exclusively as a warrior. My friend, Dane Thomas, who I've learned a tremendous amount from, has a quote. He says, if you're working too hard, you're probably a shit magician. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, that kind of hits home. Being a magician in the world is not, it's magic with a CK. It's understanding intentionality. It's acting through intention. It's understanding the energetics around what you're doing, not just the tasks that you're doing. It's knowing what you're telling somebody and the intention and energy you're conveying it with. And when he said that, I was like, wow, he's right. I've always worked too hard and I've always been a shit magician. And so moving into the space where mm -hmm. I use more intentionality, more energetics, more of my experience to be able to move the world around rather than just going and brute forcing it myself is something that I'm focused on and have been for a while. Fuck yeah. <laughs> That's a fucking mic drop response. I know we're coming up on time. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that I should have? If anybody wants to hear more of what I do, I'd love them. Either, if you're listening to Ani and I right now, you're probably a podcast listener. I have a podcast called Momentum for the Entrepreneurial Personality Type. I just put out a podcast today, yesterday called The Danger of Wanting Your Team to Like You. It was like something you mentioned earlier, and it uncovers so much of the conversation we have. We just got three times the normal download we get on a podcast. So normally when we put out podcasts the first day, we get about 1,100 downloads. We have 3,000 something downloads. Wow. So obviously it was a day at home. And so you can go to MomentumPodcast.com or search Momentum Podcast, or sorry, Momentum for the Entrepreneurial Personality Type on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere that podcasts are. And that's like the best place to connect with our information. Beautiful. And will you also share the kind of entrepreneurs you work with and exactly how you help them? Just so if there's anyone listening who fits the bill can reach out to you. And guys, I can pers I have many friends who've gone through the Simple Operations program. Everyone raves about it. The work that Alex does is absolutely phenomenal. And this is really, it really matures 
a company, it matures the entrepreneur, it matures the company. And if you're listening to this and you work with me, this is a great compliment because a lot of the stuff that Alex teaches and talks about really focuses on the mechanics. So just share a little bit about who it's for, how you help them and what sort of situation people are in typically before they, they work with you. You got it, Ani. We've worked with all different types of businesses, but where we have the highest level of effectiveness is working with new economy entrepreneurs. So typically online businesses that are in the educational coaching product, any type of, of information company that's in uh, online, usually with a virtual team and has hit somewhere between one and 10 million and is struggling to grow due to the fact that the entrepreneur is the biggest bottleneck. And so if you feel like you're the biggest bottleneck in your business, if you feel like you're doing the same thing over and over again, but you're not getting the results, if you feel like the business is plateaued, if you feel like the business is going to grow so fast, it's going to bury you, that's who we work with. And we help take those companies from the growth that they've experienced into hyper growth, typically taking seven figure entrepreneurs into multi eight figures in a few year period. And a lot of the people we've done this with, it's not something that we put on our website. It's actually something we do. We have a roster of people who've done this. And if you're interested in understanding more about what we do and how we could help you, you can go to simpleoperations.com. The name says what we do. And there's a link there where you can fill out a survey for my team and set up a call. And we will get on a call and consult with you. We don't sell. We'll consult and let you know if we're able to help you. Beautiful. Guys, if any of this is interesting, I definitely recommend reaching out to Alex. Follow him on all the socials. Check out his podcast. Look up Simple Operations. This is a man of the highest integrity. And there's a few people of this category that I definitely recommend following. And Alex is at the top of that list. So thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, you are fucking limitless.